morning. We welcome you to beautiful Savior Lutheran Church. We're glad to see that you're here to worship with us this morning. Uh, Today we celebrate especially Christ the King Sunday. It is the last Sunday in the church calendar. Next year, or next uh, week, we start a new church year. Uh, And so with that comes uh, our time together today talking about the last day when Jesus is going to come back and what that means for his kingship and what that means for us in our lives today. And so we pray for God's continued blessings on our message and on our worship today. Uh, We want to make sure we welcome everybody this morning as well, especially those who are here for Jordan's baptism. Uh, We're glad that you're here. Would you please stand? And we worship our God uh, in, uh, excuse me, we worship in the name of our God who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Pastor Tom. Thank you, Pastor. Would you please turn and face the baptismal font? In baptism, our gracious Heavenly Father frees us from sin and from death by joining us to the death and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. We are born children of a fallen humanity by water and the Holy Spirit. We are reborn children of God, inheritors of eternal life, and made members of the church, the body of Christ. Nourished by the Eucharist, by teaching and fellowship, and by prayer, we are empowered to live among the communion of saints in the fullness of baptism, growing in faith, love, and obedience to the will of God. Sponsors, would you please present Jordan? We present Jordan Joel Barnes. Thank you very much. And Brittany and Jeremy, called by the Holy Spirit, trusting in the grace and love of God, do you desire to have Jordan baptized into Christ? As you bring Jordan to receive the gift of baptism, you are entrusted with responsibilities to live with her among God's faithful people, to bring her to the Word of God and to the Holy Meal, to teach her the Lord's Prayer, the Creed, and the Ten Commandments, place in her hands the Holy Scriptures, and nurture her in faith and prayer so that she may learn to trust God, proclaim Christ through word and deed, and live in the covenant of baptism in communion with the church. And do you promise to help Jordan grow in the Christian faith and life? That's blessings to you as you do that. And from ancient times, the church has observed the custom of raising up sponsors for baptismal candidates to pray for them and support them in their ongoing walk of the Christian faith. Tiffany, Matt, Nate, and AJ, do you promise to nurture Jordan in the Christian faith as you are empowered by the Holy Spirit and to help her live in the covenant of baptism and in communion with the church? We do. God's blessings to you as you do that for her. And people of God, do you promise to support Jordan, to join in the fulfilling of these promises and to pray for her in her new life in Christ? We do with the help of God. I ask all of you then on behalf of Jordan to profess your faith in Christ Jesus, reject sin, and confess the faith of the church, the faith in which we baptize, and to answer with parents and godparents, the questions which I will address to Jordan. Do you renounce the devil and all the forces of evil which defy God? Do Do you renounce the powers of this world that rebel against God? Do Do you renounce the ways of sin that draw you from God? Do Do you believe in God the Father? Do you believe in Jesus Christ, the Son of God? I believe in Jesus Christ, the only Son of our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. Do you believe in God the Holy Spirit? The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. Blessed are you, O God, maker and ruler of all things. We give you thanks that in the beginning your spirit moved over the waters, and by your word you created the world, calling forth life in which you took delight. Through the waters of the flood you delivered Noah and his family, and through the sea you led your people Israel 
from slavery into freedom. At the river, your son was baptized by John and anointed with the Holy Spirit. By the baptism of Jesus' death and resurrection, you set us free from the power of sin and death and raise us up to live in you. Pour out your Holy Spirit, the power of your living word, that those who are washed in the waters of baptism may be given new life. To you be given honor and praise through Jesus Christ our Lord in the unity of the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Maybe would you hold that for me? You want to bring her in? And the rest of you get right around here, okay? Jordan Joel Lund, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. That's hers as well. Let us pray. We give you thanks, O God, that through water and the Holy Spirit you give your daughters and sons new birth, cleanse them from sin, and raise them to eternal life. Sustain Jordan with the gift of your Holy Spirit the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord, the spirit of joy in your presence, both now and forever. Amen. Amen. Jordan Joel Lund, receive the sign of the cross, both over your forehead and over your heart, to mark you as one redeemed by Christ the crucified. May the Lord bless your coming in and your going out from this time forth, and even forevermore. Amen. Amen. Receive this burning light to show that you have received Christ, who is the light of the world. Let your light so shine before others that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Let us speak our welcome to Jordan together. We welcome you into the body of Christ and into the mission we share. Join us in giving thanks and praise to God and bearing God's creative and redeeming word to, to all the world.
The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. O God of power and might, your Son shows us the way of service, and in him we inherit the riches of your grace. Give us the wisdom to know what is right and the strength to serve the world you have made. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Kim. All right, good morning, everybody. I'd like to invite the children to come up for the children's message. And if you're visiting today, we'd love to have you come up and join us. You could bring in a grown-up with you or another friend or whatever. Just come on up. Good morning. How are you guys? Good to see you. Happy Thanksgiving. Good morning. Come on up, you guys. Good to see you. Yeah. Hi, come on up. Good to see you guys. Come on in. Yeah, plenty of room. Lots of room up here. Good morning. Oh, you guys, I want to talk to you today about how you show love. Can we talk about that? Come on up. Yeah, let's talk about how we show love. I have a quick question today. Do you love your parents? Yeah. You do? Do you think they know you love them? Yeah. How do they know? Um, how do they know? Um, they know this. They know that, that they love us because they love us so much. They do love you. How do they know you love them? I have a question. Do you help with the dishes sometimes? Yeah. Do you? Um, help maybe make beds sometimes? Yeah. Do you give hugs to your parents? Yeah. Do you try and obey as much as possible? When you're in church, do you sit and listen? Yeah. Those are all ways that you show your mom and dad you love them. Instead of just telling them, you show them, and I know you do, and I know they know you love them. You know, two of my kids are here today, and they know I love them, not just because I tell them, but because I give them food, I give them giant hugs when they come home. If they need something like help with homework or they just want to talk, I drop whatever I'm doing and I talk to them and help them. I show them I love them with the actions that I have, right? That's how they know I love them, not just because I say I love you, but because I show them I love them. And that's really what, as Christians, we want to do with our love. Do you know that God loves you? Um, God loves you. How do you know God loves you? Is there food in your house to eat right now? There is? God provides you with all the food you need. Is there a warm roof over your head and a cozy bed to hop into? Yeah. And do you have parents that love you? God shows us all these ways that he loves us. He doesn't just tell us in the Bible, I love you. He shows us every day. And the most important gift he gave us to show the biggest love ever known to anyone on this earth was, look up at that cross. Jesus, when he knew that our sin would make us die, he said, no, I love you too much for that. I'm going to show you how much I love you, and I'm going to give you Jesus. And Jesus is going to suffer, and he doesn't have to, because he's a king. We sung it today. He's a king, but he's going to come here and suffer, because that's how much God loves you. He showed it to you, didn't he? So one last piece of that love now. If God loves us that much, and we have that much love inside our heart for God, we want to show it, don't we? We want to show Jesus how much we love him too. Do you know this is so convenient? In today's scripture reading, Jesus makes it really easy for us. He gives us all the great ways we can show that love for him. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you some of them. And I'm going to read you some of them, and I'm going to tell you good news. You've already done one really good way to show you. Operation Christmas. How did you know? Did you look at my bag? All right, well, you get to hold that, Nick. Did you guys do Operation Christmas Child? You were helping a kid far away who needed to be shown Jesus' love. That was one way to show his love. Good job. Now, he also says when people are hungry or thirsty, we need to help them. So, I bet you can find lots of food shelves. We have some here. We help Prism Food Shelf. Will you hold that? So we can give food to people who are hungry and drinks to people who are thirsty. When people don't have clothes or pleats, things to keep them warm, you know what you can do? We have a lady in our neighborhood who collects mittens and hats, so this is what I have here. I'm going to put these in her box today. But you can help with that, right? That's showing love with your actions. Have you ever heard this around Christmas time? Yeah. Yeah, when you go into the store and there's a red kettle? Yeah. That's a good way to show love, isn't it? Yeah. When you go home, you could maybe put a couple of your, um, 
a couple of your coins that you get from your allowance or whatever you have from your piggy bank, maybe you could carry them to the store next time yeah. and you could drop them in to help somebody because in that kettle, that money goes to help people who need it. You know, you don't have to give things to help too. Do you know what else you could do? When you're at preschool or daycare or Sunday school and you see a child who's not with anyone else, who's alone, maybe you could sit with that person and show them the love of Jesus by being their friend or just helping them that day. There's so many ways to show love. God's love for us is bigger than we can imagine. So let's practice this week. I want you just to pick one thing when you go back to your pew. I want you to think. What's one thing you can do this week to show how much God loves you and how much you love you can God? Share. You can Absolutely, share. that's a good way. You think about that this week, all right? Will you pray with me? Dear God, thank you for loving us. Thank you for showing that love in Jesus. Help me to do that. Help me to use my hands and feet to show your love. Amen. Great job, you guys. Thanks, Nick. Thank you, ma'am. A reading from Ezekiel. For thus says the Lord God, Behold, I, I myself will sh search for my sheep and will seek them out. As a shepherd seeks out his flock when he is among his sheep that have been scattered, so will I seek out my sheep. And I will rescue them from all places where they have been scattered on a day of clouds and thick darkness. And I will bring them out from the peoples and gather them from the countries and will bring them into their own land. And I will feed them on the mountains of Israel by the ravines and in all the inhabited places of the country. I will feed them with good pasture and on the mountain heights of Israel shall be their grazing land. There they shall lie down in good grazing land and on rich pasture they shall feed on the mountains of Israel. I myself will be the shepherd of my sheep and I myself will make them lie down, declares the Lord God. I will seek the lost and I will bring back the strayed and I will bind up the injured and I will strengthen the weak and the fat and the strong I will destroy. I will feed them in justice. Therefore, thus says the Lord God to them, behold, I, I myself will judge between the fat sheep and the lean sheep, because you push with side and shoulder and thrust at all the weak with your horns till you have scattered them abroad. I will rescue my flock. They shall no longer be a prey, and I will judge between sheep and sheep, and I will set up over them one shepherd, my servant David, and he shall feed them. He shall feed them and be their shepherd, and I, the Lord, will be their God, and my servant David shall be prince among them. I am the Lord, I have spoken. The word of the Lord.
reading from 1 Corinthians. Paul writes, But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For as by a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive, but each in his own order. Christ the first fruits, then it is coming those who belong to Christ. Then comes the end when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father after destroying every rule and every authority and power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. For God has put all things in subjection under his feet. But when it says all things are put in subjection, it is plain that he is accepted who put all things in subjection under him. When all things are subjected to him, then the Son himself will also be subjected to him who put all things in subjection under him, that God may be all in all. The word of the Lord. reading from the Holy Gospel according to Matthew. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus says, when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. Before him will be gathered all the nations and he will separate people one from another as the shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will place the sheep on his right, but the goats on the left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you something to drink? And when did we see you a stranger and welcome you, or naked and clothe you? And when did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer them, Truly I say to you, as you did it, one, as you did it to one of the least of my brothers, you did it to me. Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you cursed, into the eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you did not welcome me, naked, and you did not clothe me, sick, and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they also will answer, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry, or thirsty, or a stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison, and did not minister to you? Then he will say to them, uh, then he will answer them, saying, Truly I say to you, as you did not do it to, the, to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment but the righteous into eternal life. The Gospel of the Lord. Please be seated. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Dear friends of Christ, have you ever been in this situation where maybe the week's gone a little bit long for you, right? Things aren't going your way. It's just taking forever to get to the end of the week. And so you have something at the end that's kind of pulling you along right? Some kind of event that you want to go to that you're looking forward to, like a, a movie or a, a play or, or reading a book. And so it's kind of helping you get through the doldrums of that week. It's kind of making you a little bit excited as you go from day to day as you get closer to that event. And so you're so excited that you talk to your friends about your plans, right? What you're going to do. You're going to go see that movie or that play or read that book, And your friends share in your excitement. But then you have that one friend, as I'm sure we all do, 
who not only shares in your excitement, but also shares with you how that movie or that play or that book actually ends. Have you ever been there before? It's kind of disappointing, isn't it? Because that's why you go. You want to know how it ends, the movie, the play, the book, all of those things. That's why you do them. You want to see how it ends. But your friend couldn't help from telling you what the ending actually was. But you know, maybe not all is lost. And so you go to the movie or the play or you read the book. And in doing those things, you all of a sudden come to appreciate the middle a little bit more. Because you know the ending. You know where the story is going. And so in the middle, you pick up little nuances or little pieces of conversation that really kind of heighten that ending for you and, and kind of bring it to a, a full circle for you. Yeah, maybe not all is lost when you know the ending, especially when your friend decides to tell it to you. Well, I set up the situation here for you this morning because I think it helps us understand our text for today from Matthew chapter 25 a little bit better. Because we have our friend Jesus telling us the end of the movie. He's telling us how this world comes to an end. But in doing so, we not only gain a little bit more understanding about the ending and about his kingship in the midst of that ending, but we also grow in our appreciation for the middle, the time between now and when Jesus returns on that last day. And so that's what we're going to look at in our time together today, that ending, but also what it means for us now as we experience the middle of the movie. So let's start with that ending. Look to the screen. And there Jesus says, When the Son of Man comes in his glory, in all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. Before him will be gathered all the nations, and he will separate people one from another, as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will place the sheep on his right, but the goats on his left. So what we see on this last day is that all the nations will be brought before Jesus, the ruler, the king, for eternity. All the people are brought before him. And with this great gathering comes a great separation. Uh, You know, the sheep, the believers will be on the right, and the goats, the unbelievers, will be on the left-hand side. And the sheep, the believers, get to spend eternity with Jesus, whereas the goats, the unbelievers, get to spend eternity with Jesus with the evil one. And so we get this understanding of a great gathering and a great separation. And as we continue in the text, we almost seem to get a glimpse as to how that separation comes to be. Like what criteria are used in determining where the sheep and goats spend eternity. And so we're going to look at that in our text. First the sheep and then the goats. Look to the screen. For the sheep, it says, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. So that's the sheep. Let's look at the goats. Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you did not welcome me. Naked, and you did not clothe me. Sick, and in prison, and you did not visit me. So what does it look like? What does it look like for the criteria used to separate the sheep from the goats and where they spend eternity? Well, if we take this text by itself, it looks like works, doesn't it? As if feeding or clothing or not doing those things plays a role in where you spend eternity. And that's problematic for us, especially because of how we spent our October together as a church. Because if you remember in October, we celebrated the 500th anniversary of the Reformation. And during that entire month, we basically talked about how we are saved by grace. How we are saved through the undeserved love that comes from Jesus Christ. Yet here in Matthew chapter 25, it appears that our works play a role in that salvation. And so how do we reconcile that? 
How do we make that work in our lives today? Well, I think the best way to do that is to go back to the text we used basically throughout October, Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. Look to the screen and let's read this together. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. We are saved by grace through faith, not by works. That is the absolute truth of Scripture, that we are saved by the undeserved love that comes from Jesus Christ. And you know the words today from Matthew chapter 25 don't change that truth. It doesn't change the absolute truth that comes from Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. Because as we look at Ephesians 2, 8 through 10, yes, we are saved by grace, but that's not the only part that grace plays a role in our lives. Grace is not just impacting the salvation part of our lives and leaving everything else alone. No, instead what we see in that text is that grace, yes, does impact salvation and gives us that gift, but it also works in our everyday life. That undeserved love changes our hearts and our minds because it rules and reigns in our hearts and our minds, just as Christ our King rules in our hearts and in our minds. And so this grace changes how we live, what we do, how we speak, all of those things so that we are able to do the good works that God has given us in advance to do. Not for our salvation, but because of grace at work in every element, in every aspect of our lives. That's what the sheep from Matthew chapter 25 were doing. They were living into the grace that was theirs through Jesus Christ by feeding and clothing and welcoming and all of those things. They weren't doing them because they thought he would give them eternal life. No, they already knew where life was for them. It was found in Jesus and his grace at work in their lives. And we see that just by the surprise of the sheep, right? When did we see you doing this? When did we do these things for you? All of those things. They weren't thinking that it really mattered because they knew where life came from. And they knew what it meant for them as they lived out their lives here on this earth. And in the same way for us, that grace of Christ rules and reigns in our hearts and our minds because Christ rules and reigns in those places as well. And so it means that, yes, we know where our salvation comes from. That it comes from that grace of Jesus Christ. And then that grace empowers us, motivates us, changes us to go into the world and serve God others, to love our neighbors, our families, our friends, our co-workers, whoever they may be, wherever you are in life. And you know, to be honest, there's a struggle with that in our lives as Christians. It's actually a, a pretty big point of contention, uh, especially for the Lutheran church, because we, we cling so heavily onto that fact that we are saved by grace. And that's a great place to cling. If you're going to cling anywhere, right, if you're going to be the Garfield in the car, hang on to that grace that comes from Jesus Christ. But that's not the only place where grace is at work. Because when we do that, we often think that we don't have to do anything, that we've punched our clock, that we're just waiting for Jesus to come back, and so the works don't mean much. They don't matter to God whatsoever. But we see in the text that they do. Or even when it comes to thinking that we can retire at some point from serving in his kingdom or serving our neighbors or loving our neighbors that somehow we've put in our time so we can back away. Except for the fact that Christ's rule and reign with his grace continues always in this life into eternity. Or even the thought process that, you know, I'm just not gifted enough. I don't have the gifts to go serve and love my neighbor, so I'm I'm not going to do that because I don't know that God's given me those gifts. 
Well, either way, there's a lot of different reasons not to go into the world and serve with the grace of Jesus Christ, and they all end up in the same place with nothing getting done. Those good works that God has given in advance for us to do, then don't get done. And may this never be, dear friends, because that grace changes our lives and it changes how we serve in this life. And it actually helps us appreciate more what's happening in this life. To go back to our movie analogy, that grace of Jesus Christ at work throughout our entire life helps us appreciate the middle all the more. It helps us find joy in the midst of this life while we wait for Christ to return because it's fulfilling to serve and love our neighbors, to serve and love our family, our friends, whoever they may be, wherever you are in this life. And I know that's a challenge. I know our world today presents a very real challenge for us as Christians to do that, to serve and love the people of this world. Because let's be honest, the church has lost relevance in the world today. The culture doesn't view the church as it once did, and so we're no longer high up on this pedestal. In fact, we're pretty low when it comes to the view of the world. But you know, dear friends, it's actually not a bad place to be because it's there where we can serve with humility. And you know who else did that when he came into this world? It's the Sunday school answer. What is it? Jesus, exactly. Jesus became a humble servant when he came into this world to serve and love the people of this world, no matter who they are and no matter what they may think of us or what we're doing. And you know, I actually read an article this past week from the Concordia Journal regarding that very fact that while the church is losing its relevance, It's actually a great place for us to be as we serve and live into the grace that Jesus Christ has given to us. It looks like this, the Concordia Journal. And the title of the article is Narrating the Church at the Dusk of Christendom, if that matters to you at all. And it's written by Theodore Hopkins. And I'd like to read some excerpts from his article here because it's actually fairly lengthy. So I just wanted to condense a little bit of that and read that to you. He writes, the service of Christ Jesus was not only about acts of mercy, but also entering into life with humanity, growing in favor and stature, listening and living with creatures as well as giving. Genuine Christian service is more than giving to another in need. Christian service receives another as truly human, made in the image of God. Congregations then serve their communities first by being present with them listening and learning. Such service does not come with ready-made answers, quick to talk and slow to listen, but follows the humiliation of Jesus to come into life with the community and the world. Therefore, the congregation's goal for service is not to get things done so that it can feel better about itself. Instead, the congregation's goal is to enter into life with local people serving the community from within. This may lead to working with or for the community, but fundamentally, being with people treats them as humans created and redeemed by God. So dear friends, if you want to live into the grace of Jesus Christ in our lives, go spend time with people. Go spend time with grandma and grandpa and listen to their stories, no matter how boring they may seem to you. Go spend time with your kids. Go spend time with your family and your friends. Get to know your neighbors. Don't be a stranger to them, especially if you're new in the community. Go get to know them. And if you don't know them, go welcome them. In the same way here at Beautiful Savior, you may not know the people in your pew here this morning, and that's okay, but don't let it be that way. Don't let it stay that way forever. Welcome them. Greet one another. And let's get to know one another. Yes, go feed the hungry and clothe them. There's no doubt about that. But then listen to their story. 
Get to know them and where they're coming from and what they've done. And if you're not sure how to do that, there's a great opportunity through Soul Care, a place that goes into homeless places, homeless shelters, and works on their feet. No, you do not have to touch feet to do this, okay? It's a great thing. You could just sit by them and listen to their stories and get to know them a little bit better and see them as God loves them and as God sees them. Because when we do that, dear friends, to whoever it is in this life, we share and show with them that somebody does love them, that somebody does care for them, that somebody does value them. And it's not just us, but it's Jesus, the King, the shepherd who not only separates the sheep from the goats, but also gathers the sheep to himself for all eternity. So yeah, dear friends, we know how this movie ends. And we don't know how long we have left until we get to that ending. But as we wait, we know that as we travel in this middle time, that God's grace is with us today and always. Because Christ is our King, our Shepherd, walks with us always. Amen? Amen. Please rise for prayer. Welcoming God's reign of righteousness and mercy. Let us pray with people of every time and every place. Almighty God, your merciful rule encompasses all the world. As we gather for worship in safety here and at Good Shepherd Lutheran Church in Rochester, Illinois, and Ascension Lutheran Church in Landover Hills, Maryland, we pray for places where the church is persecuted. Watch over your people as they witness to your good news. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Give bountiful pastures, safety, and health to herds, livestock, and all animals. May our care for all of your creation reflect your shepherding love for all that you have made. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for international organizations that shine your light in places of strife, especially in Egypt. Lead relief and aid workers, leaders and volunteers to seek the lost and provide safety. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our prayer. prayer. Bind up the injured and strengthen the weak, abused, or ill, especially those we name before you now, silently or aloud. <laughs> Give wisdom to counselors, doctors, nurses, and all in professions that provide healing. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Shepherd your churches to welcome the stranger and immigrant in our midst. Call all your people to welcome, clothe, feed, and visit those in need just as you have provided for the lost and despair despairing throughout the ages. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Strengthen parents to be teachers and examples of righteousness for their children, rejoicing always in the gifts they are to us, especially the newly baptized Jordan Joel Lund. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lead us to be thankful for this congregation and the talents and treasures each person brings. Bring new talents to blossom among us as we encourage and build up one another and continue to grow in generosity. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Reinforce the bonds of friendship and relationship in our community that many will come to know Christ at Beautiful Savior. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Give us the hope to which you call us our glorious inheritance with all your saints. Enrich our lives with the faith and vision of those saints who have died, especially Sally Isaac's mother, Frances Callahan. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Receive these prayers and the hopes and concerns of our hearts, O God, as we entrust into your loving care all for whom we pray. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Please be seated. We continue to worship as we engage in our offering of generosity. Let us pray. Merciful God, as grains of wheat scattered upon the hills were gathered together to become one bread, so let your church be gathered together from the ends of the earth into your kingdom. For yours is the glory through Jesus Christ, now and forever. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift 
lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right and salutary that we should at all times and in all places offer thanks and praise to you, O Lord, Holy Father, through Christ our Lord, who on this day overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. And so with the church on earth, and the hosts of heaven. We praise your name and join their unending Jesus Christ, on the same night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it, gave it to his disciples, and he said, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also, he took the cup after supper. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you all. Let us offer one another a greeting of peace. The peace of
true body and true blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you, keep you, and lift you up, body and soul, unto life everlasting. Go in his peace and in his joy. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Wise and generous God, we thank you that at this holy table you have fed us again with the food of everlasting life. Send us with your blessing to seek the good of our neighbor and call others to your feast. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Amen. God Almighty, send you light and truth to keep you all the days of your life. The hand of God protect you. The holy angels accompany you. And the blessing of Almighty God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you now and forever. Amen. Peace, live in love as Christ loves us. Thanks be to God.